brought to you by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, hearing loss can affect a child's social skills and their ability to communicate. Here to discuss how medical advances can improve a child's hearing loss. In the studio, we have Stu Schmidberger, who is president of the New Jersey chapter of the Alexander Graham Bell Association for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Dr. Kevin Kwong, Associate Professor of Surgery at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Tanya Navarro, whose daughter had cochlear implant surgery. And finally, Nancy Schumann is a speech language pathologist. I want to thank all of you for joining us. <clears throat> I want to make it clear that throughout this program, we're going to have the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital website up and also your website up of your organization. That's Tell everyone right. what it is again. It's the Alexander Graham Bell Association for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. We're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. Your personal connection to the <clears throat> subject, talk about it. Well, it started with my daughter. She was born deaf. We didn't know that at all. She was born two months prematurely. We both almost died, um, but she came through it. Six weeks after she was born, we brought her home, and I noticed that she wasn't hearing things. Mm -hmm. And it could have been because I actually work for an ENT specialist mm. through high school and college. And I did hearing tests in that office. So I just noticed that she wasn't responding the way most children do. How Even long ago was this? My daughter's <clears throat> 21 years old now. It was 1994. Sure. So um, I kept taking her back to the pediatrician who said, don't worry about it. Sometimes children don't react to noises. There's nothing to worry about. You're just a nervous mother. I said, fine. Well, 10 months this went on where I had to convince the doctors. You. Yes, that there was something wrong with my daughter. Again, it was 1994. What's the big difference between 94 and going into 2016? We have newborn <coughs> hearing screening today in all 50 states, which means before a child leaves the hospital, you will know if they have either passed or failed. Some people don't like that word failed, but in reality, they do not pass the hearing screening. So just like the 10-point APGAR tests, the what? this APGAR test, which is just a 10-point test that babies are given to make sure everything is fine before they leave the hospital, this hearing test, newborn hearing screening, is given and you will know whether or not your baby might have a hearing loss. From that point on, mm. you can go back, have it checked, um, and get amplification on that baby but before they're three months old. So doctor, it's interesting, as we're talking about this, the description of today mm -hmm. and what happens with a baby, mm -hmm. and whether you and your colleagues are able to pick up a hearing loss problem versus 21, 22 years ago, significantly different? Very much so. I think uh, with the help of the newborn hearing screen, we, as a doctor, be more cognizant about the, you know, there's a child that was born that are deaf or with hearing impairment, so that we will be working them up very aggressively to find out what's the cause of the hearing loss. So in general, there are two types of hearing loss that we, we are trying to differentiate. Two One, types. Two types. One is conductive hearing loss. Conductive. Mm -hmm. By the way, you go on, on the website on your website, you're going to find this information. That's correct. Conductive. Go ahead. And the other is like neuro sensory neural hearing loss, meaning sensory neural, neural hearing, hearing loss. loss. Go ahead. The two main difference between the two is the conductive hearing loss is more surgical uh, problem, while the neuro sensory hearing loss is more like a permanent problem that we cannot cure per se, but we can help by amplifying the sound for the patients. So, oh, this is interesting, because your daughter, yes. Rosabelle, had what kind of hearing problem? I don't know exactly the name. But Dr. Kwan, can you help here? It would be the uh, sensory neural hearing loss, because that's, that's the second that's kind. The second kind. So that surgery did not fix it. Did not fix it, but the surgery can help to amplify the sound to help the problem. When did you know there was an issue? Right after, before go to the house when I get burned, they do the test that she said they didn't did in her daughter before. They did in mine, and she didn't pass. They did it three she times. She didn't pass. She didn't pass. What was your first reaction? 
so upset. I said, I cannot believe my daughter. Something wrong. I didn't accept the reality. You wouldn't accept it? No. I was hoping there was something wrong, not with my daughter. And then they keep doing different tests, and she stopped feeling, feeling, and feeling. So finally, we went to Hackensack. They do some tests on her. So she started wearing the hearing aids first when she was six months old. And so then when do you come into the picture here? Well, um, I actually saw Rosabelle a little bit the later age after she failed the hearing, hearing aid uh, help, you know. Um, uh, around, I think, two years old or yeah. so, I, you know, I was, um, uh, the first time I saw her and offered the cochlear implant option for yeah, Let's her. talk about the cochlear implant. This is an important piece of it because that information will be on your website as well as well as yours. Mm -hmm. The cochlear implant, I've heard about it. Let's mm -hmm. help people understand what it is because your daughter has the cochlear the co implant. Yes. Go ahead. Right. This is a device, implantable, implantable device into the inner ear, try to amplify the sound so that to help the child to hear. So what it does is because um, certain part of the ear, the inner ear, the sensory cells is not working. So we have to implant the device to bypass those cells to stimulate the nerve directly to help them hear. How effective? Very effective. Mm -hmm. As Well, let's say if we have a child who is deaf on both sides of the ears, and if, if we implant the child by one year old, they can be probably mainstream, like, you know, hear much better and go back to the mainstream school by a couple of years. A lot of age. success. Nancy, jump in. So the difference is when, when a child's identified with a hearing loss and they meet an audiologist and they get hearing aids, we look to see if they can get a benefit from the hearing aid. And depending upon the loss, and a hearing aid will make things louder. And so if louder is sufficient, then the child will have access to sound and be able to learn to speak. Sure. And then we'll see what other accommodations they need. When a kid has a sensory neural hearing loss and they're deaf, profoundly deaf, they don't hear anything, hearing aids can't make anything louder if it doesn't work. So the cochlear implant bypasses the issue of the inner ear that doesn't work and goes directly to stimulating the auditory nerve in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so what we know now from research is that if a child has access to sound, the parts of the brain that listen are the parts of the brain that build the foundation for learning language. So with a cochlear implant, the child has access to sound, and then with a lot of intensive and specific therapy, they learn how to use that electrical signal to process speech and environmental noises so that they learn how to listen Describe and speak. Describe the therapy. Well, it's most fun if you're doing it, but um, the beginning of it is, is teaching children. This is what um, Tanya did with Rosabelle in the beginning. When there's a noise, it's a sensory so response. So, Tanya, you're involved in it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, talk about it, and then I'll get you back in. Go ahead. So, the, the parent participates. We do auditory verbal therapy. Auditory which is verbal, verbal therapy. therapy. Because what we're looking for is listening and spoken language outcomes. The parents who participate in this kind of therapy want their child to listen and to learn how to speak as a foundation for participating Give in school. Give us an example. Uh, example. What would you, yeah. So what would you say to your daughter? How would you actually do this with your daughter? Before or after? Oh, oh before or after the surgery, you mean? Yeah. So, oh, this is interesting. You're mm -hmm. saying the therapy was very different before the cochlear implant. Oh, oh absolutely. How, yeah. how, how, how are it different? For example, she can understand anything. She just guessing. Before surgery. Before surgery. After the surgery, she enjoying everything. Even she was hyper <laughs> before the surgery. That, let's put that picture, put up Rosabelle again, if we could. Mm -hmm. But keep talking, go ahead. It's, it's amazing the, what the surgery worked for my daughter. I get so emotional when I talk about it. Before, She's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> That's my daughter. Before the surgery, she was l like a, a piece of, uh, I don't know how to explain. She didn't understand anything. But now you talk to her, she's, oh, I, can't, I can't want some how much, more, how much more alive is she? How much? How much more alive is she today? Um, 
Allah. She, she has friends today she didn't have before? Oh, she's a friendly girl. She talked to, <laughs> even when you pass them by, she say hi. She didn't do this before? No, and the Just, first time no, when they turn the cochlear implant on, she gets so scared, she start crying. And she look at me like, mommy, what happened? What's going on? Oh my God. That was a new wall for I her. I heard she wasn't eating as much before. No. And after the cochlear oh implant. Oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> Jump in. I was just going to say, my daughter was born deaf, profound, <laughs> um, and we tried many different hearing aids on her, which mm -hmm. of course didn't work because there was nothing to amplify. Right. She had her first implant at three and a half because, again, back then, um, even the surgeons who were doing it would say, let's try the amplification, we'll keep trying stronger and strong, stronger hearing aids. And for children, you know, they, they were holding off a little bit. She was on implanted. She, but. In 1997, she was implanted. It took her, truthfully, it's hard work at that time, about over two years before she could repeat things to us. But it took two years and three months. I remember telling other parents that when she discovered what language was, what listening and spoken language yeah. was with the therapy, oh, I have to speak to you. There's a conversation going on. I can mm -hmm. get information from you, and you can give it to me. This is it. She got her second implant at the age of 18 mm. because she wanted to go to college. Mm. And she felt she has many friends with implants, hearing aids, uh, different kinds of devices. Her principal, as a matter of fact, is a bilateral cochlear implant user. What does that mean? Uh, two sides, bilateral. Wow. So she got her second implant at the age of 18. And I'm proud to say that my deaf daughter is now studying at college. She is a communication sciences and disorders major and is studying to become an educational audiologist. So you can go from a deaf child. Very proud. You, I'm sorry <laughs> to interrupt you. You can go from? You can go from being a child. We just, oh my God, she's deaf. Mm -hmm. How terrible. How are you going to communicate? Do you have to do this? To a child who is now in college, totally independent, wonderful girl <laughs> and is becoming an audiologist to help others who are like her. And, and as I'm listening, these are powerful, impactful, inspiring stories that are very real. But it, what's becoming so clear, and we need to talk about this a little bit more, is the connection between the ability to hear and the ability to learn. Mm -hmm. The thing Absolutely. that's interesting, so I met Rosabelle as part of the process before she got a cochlear implant. You have to go through a process to be evaluated. And it was clear to me. How that old was she, she at the time? Two, before her third birthday. Okay. So it was clear to me that she was a smart little girl and she was social. How would you know Big that? smile. Because <laughs> when I put things out and I showed her I wanted them sorted a certain way or I wanted hmm. things done in an order, if I showed her what I wanted, she could do it. However, if I said, can you give me the chair, or she couldn't hand it to me because she didn't know that word. But if I looked and I said, do you want to sit down? Maybe the bear wants to sit down. If I looked at the bear and I looked at the chair, she would move the bear and put it in the chair. After her cochlear implant, when she came back and I said, um, I don't know, do you think that bear wants to eat? She picked up, the, look, not looking at me, picked up the bear, moved it to a table, and started to feed it. So the difference is between figuring out what's going on and understanding the language. If you want to learn to read, you need that language base first. So the cochlear implant and the access to sound mm -hmm. is what has supported Rosabelle. So she's successful in preschool, and she has a future that looks like she'll be successful in kindergarten moving forward Amazing. the way that Paige has. And today, Steve, it is very different. It took my daughter a lot longer because she was older when she first got that implant. Today, it's very important to get early intervention services in. There's a 136 model, one month. 136, what does that mean? Yes, that means. Um, one month uh, to be identified, three months to get that amplification in there. And at three months, it would be a hearing aid, mm -hmm. even with a profound loss. And then at six months to make sure that those intervention services are being done. And in many cases, it's even earlier than that. So today, where it took my daughter quite a while to understand, today, that child who was implanted by the age of 12 months is ready for mainstream, mm -hmm. um, you know, much, much earlier. And one thing I must say, you haven't heard these children, but if you spoke to a child today who is deaf, that was implanted with good support services, you would not be able to, to even imagine that they had any kind Maybe of not. hearing loss. If you blindfold, if you get blindfold and listen to them, they would talk like normal. 
you would not be able to. No, no. So, Dr. Let me ask you: the cochlear implant is it the state of the art technology right now? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's been out there using for commercially for about 20 years. Uh, but the technology has been improving year by year. We, we are talking about the processing powers and the clarity of the sound and, and things are improving year by year. So it is a very powerful uh, device. I'm also curious about something else. In your research, mm -hmm. in your work with your colleagues, A, do we know what causes hearing loss in a child? And B, based on what we know, is there anything we can do to prevent it? Oh, that's a huge research opportunity go, uh, out there uh, on stem cell research and trying to regenerate this, the damaged cells in the ear. And this is still uh, a research uh, uh, topic, so research uh, uh, things going on for us to develop to, uh, in the future to, uh, to, uh, to apply to so a human being. So we don't being. know yet? It, we're on the right track, but we are not using it clinically in patient yet, but we are using you know, stem cells in the lab setting to develop, to re regenerate the hair cell, the, the sensory cells, so that you know, those damaged cells can be repaired. But right now, what we're doing for the cochlear implant is not repairing the cells, but we bypass the cell. Bypass the cell. Bypass the cell, but stimulate the nerve so that they still have, the, the children can have access to sound. So that's a major difference. In, in, Greg, in your work, what I'm curious about is you see the social and emotional development as well. And the educational impact. Mm -hmm. And I think it's huge is that because in speaking with parents over the years, there's a sense of, oh my gosh, my baby won't hear my voice. Oh my gosh, is my That's baby going to be able to speak? Yes. 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 So the parents wind up stop talking, what do they do? Well, it is. It's very interesting because we speak to babies because they speak back to us. And you know, Kelvin has an <laughs> right. infant at home and it's and I remember my husband saying, It's it's addictive, like you speak and she looks and then you speak and she makes noises and you want to keep on doing that. Well, deaf babies all babies make a lot of noise in the beginning because it feels good and then after a while they make noise because it sounds good and for deaf babies without amplification they often become quiet because it doesn't sound good. Well then if you have a quiet baby parents tend to stop speaking and so um, they do things and they're gesturing but they're not speaking and a typically hearing child benefits from all of that speaking and singing and reading and all of that kind of stuff. So by amplifying, identifying early, amplifying early and getting early services parents know what to do. So you're you're very good speech therapists, you're very good auditory verbal therapists, you're very good teachers of the deaf, work with parents. So parents are doing in the home what needs to be done to maximize the opportunity for them to have access to language so speech is then emerging. How much of, it's interesting, I, I, I know you do this program long enough after a couple of decades, you begin to realize that if in fact you're facing a clinical a medical situation, um, a challenge and adversity, very often <clears throat> you're better off if you're gonna be facing it today versus 15, 20, 30 years ago, maybe 10 years ago because of the medical advances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not a, true across the board, but it's true in a lot of cases. It's clearly true here, right? Mm -hmm. How much of your work today, how much of your dedication and commitment for those children who are struggling with hearing challenges is a product of your personal experience and what your daughter went through. Oh, it's, it's, it's everything. If she hadn't, if, you don't if, think you'd be here today? Uh, well, probably not because I might not know anyone who is, who is deaf. The thing is though, that today, 90% of children who are born with a hearing loss are born to hearing parents. That's, that's a large percentage. Say that again. 90% or more 95. of, the, yeah, some will say 95 actually, um, of children born with hearing loss are born to hearing parents. So now you have a child who, um, you know, you don't know what to do with. And the first thing a lot of parents go today is uh, go to the internet, look up hearing loss, who is there? Um, Good thing or bad thing? It, it could be both. It could be both. It depends on where they go. Um, part of 
the Alexander Graham Bell Association. The reason I got involved is because they really foster listening and spoken language. That was what Dr. Bell was all about. He was the inventor of the telephone. But basically, if you asked him today, if he were alive, he would say, What would he tell us a, about this? He would say, I am a teacher of the deaf. That was his main profession, not an inventor. He dedicated his life to helping the deaf learn how to get into mainstream society and not be so isolated. And all of these people that I have met over these last 21 years are amazing because the, the association is so old. I have met those adults who only use listening and spoken language prior to these implants. Um, and they're wonderful people. But today, it is so much easier. When I counsel parents, I tell them you are so lucky to know, first of all, that your child has a hearing loss so mm -hmm. early that there is technology that can help them. And yes, your daughter will get married. And yes, your son will play sports, just like my daughter surfs. She <laughs> surfs. She surfs. She's she does have a great karate. Career. Yes. It's she so has much She's easier happy. today. Absolutely. And so, what do you say to Tanya right now? To Tanya. <laughs> to turn around and talk to her. Talk well, to her. Tanya, just as I tell my parents, I'm going tonight to another one of my parent support groups. The easiest thing you can tell a parent is it will be fine. Your daughter will be fine. It's going to be a lot of work. There are going to be rough points along the way. But believe me, the end result will be wonderful. She will be part of mainstream society. She will be able to have any kind of job that she wants. And like my daughter, she wants to go into Manhattan on Halloween down to the village to watch the parade and take her phone and say, oh, mom, I'm down here today. What if Tanya doesn't want her to go there? <laughs> That's up to Tanya. <laughs> but the main thing. But she'll thing, be able to. She will be able to. Also, I, and I know it because. Now she knows. Yeah, I, and I'm sure. And I'm on the right way, thanks to the doctor. Because before I say, I, when I'm going to hear my daughter say the word, I think that was cannot happen. But now, after the surgery, I have to say, Rosibel, please stop. Shut up a little bit. Right. Give me a break. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Back up. <laughs> you are now telling your daughter. After six months. This. What are you telling her? I say, please, can you be quiet a little bit? And this... then she say, Mommy, why? What happened? This is exactly what I counsel parents. There will come a day oh my when God, you will tell your so deaf child <laughs> to please shut up. I don't want to hear you anymore. Okay. And you know, two or three years later, they come back and they say, you were right. I so, can't get so them to stop talking. how great is it for you to be oh, able to tell your know, daughter to be quiet? Oh my God. It's, is it funny to you? It's, it's funny and it's wonderful because you don't know what I went through before. I was talking to her. She can. She can, uh, sometimes she want to say something and I can understand. Tell she us what wants it was like. something like, I want milk, I want something. She started crying. And I said, Mommy, what happened? What do you want? She can tell me. She started pointing. But now she told me, Mommy, I want milk. Mommy, I want this. I don't want this. I don't want to go over there. Oh, it's over there. So it's amazing. What has it done for your family? Oh, Allah, Allah. For example, my, I have two other daughters. They they perfect fine, but now they can talk each other Ooh. before they can do it. How old are the, how old are the daughters? Sixteen and eight. And how old is your other daughter? Three. Oh my God! How close are they? Oh, they so close. They was protecting her because they say she was different. I heard that word deaf. When they say she's deaf, I don't say that word. It's her me, but it is true. That that's the name of you know. But it's it's. It's not easy for a mom to accept that you have a daughter deaf. But now, do you see her? If you don't know her history, you don't know that she has that problem. Because she talks, she's so active. She can see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you feel blessed. Oh, so much. And I keep saying thanks to the doctor, to the person who gave me there. Yeah. I should do that before, but no. I was afraid. You did it. That's what matters. Um, listen, I want to thank all of you for joining us and um, making a difference and giving hope and valuable information. And stop telling your daughter to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> An aneurysm almost took my life. When I needed a heart transplant, survival rates mattered to me. An irregular heartbeat could have ended my life. I came to Robert Wood Johnson and they repaired it through a hole smaller than a dime. But thanks to robotic technology at RWJ, I'm still here. That's why I chose RWJ. At Robert Wood Johnson, being the best means breakthroughs in cardiovascular care 
happen every day. RWJ and Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, the heart of academic medicine. Also brought to you by New Jersey Sharing Network, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and by the New Jersey Education Association.